Welcome. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I've got a lot going on in the background, but I keep trying new places in my house. I've got a lot of windows, so. Yeah, looks great. Um, got all the Christmas set up. Um, where are you calling from today? I'm curious. I live in Auburn, California, which is uh, in the Sierra foothills on the way to Lake Tahoe. Okay. Wow. I, uh, you know, the older I get, the less tolerable Indiana winters are. So I might be headed out that direction uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's actually a really cool community and people usually just zoom through it um, as they're coming from the Bay area, from San Francisco to go to Tahoe. Uh, But it's a really cool little community and we only have a couple stoplights and uh, I don't spend much time in traffic and yeah. yeah. Um, since this is the first time, uh, me seeing you, I do want to extend my condolences to you, uh, for me and mom, for Charlie. Um, I'm so okay. sorry. Um, that's it. So. Okay. Now I'm going to cry, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> I wanted to acknowledge it. Um, I appreciate so. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this time of the year is, I mean, any day is horrible, but, yeah. um, yeah, we got to, uh, uh show up for those uh i appreciate you acknowledging it because so many people just you know it's easier not to or people are afraid of saying the wrong thing Mm -hmm. and um i would say in in a situation like that uh especially if you meet someone like (laughs) i'll just tell the story really quick i went to the dentist two days ago just for teeth cleaning and um i'm like 8 a.m in the morning i'm okay i'm good i get there i love my dentist and and she puts me back in the chair and immediately starts talking about the holidays. What are you going to do for the holidays? And I just was like, oh God, the tears are coming. The tears are coming. And, um, and I finally, like the tears were coming and I just, she sat me up and doesn't know what's going on. I said, I just have to share my son died four months ago. And I mm-hmm. sometimes grief just hits me and I'm going to be okay. Let's get through this. So she gives me Kleenex and puts me back in the chair and open my mouth. And, and I just said, it's hard for me to talk about the holidays. Right. And um, so I said, like, let's just not talk about the holidays. So she puts me back in the chair and then starts talking about the holidays again, but the holidays up with her dead niece. So right. um, uh, so it just is uh, one good thing you can do with people is if you if someone says, uh, yeah, someone just died, you can say, tell me about him or what were some of his favorite mm-hmm. things to do. Um, so you can I appreciate that you acknowledge it. And uh, there's no way to do it wrong. Um but there are a lot better ways to do it right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and uh, writing has helped me a lot with dealing with the trauma of uh, losing Chooch. You know, I'm still dealing with it day by day. Um, How big of a tool has writing been for you to help Uh, with your healing? It's, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, I was a writer already, uh, but uh, I didn't know what to do. Like the first morning after Charlie died, (laughs) Uh, and I just got up and I started writing. Um, I obviously didn't expect to cry this much this soon into this or at all. But uh, um, and I so I've I've written basically in four months kind of two books. Um, and and I at first I thought I was writing like to keep Charlie alive and 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 I felt like he was really you know like giving me a lot of information and I I felt closest to him when I was writing um but then I realized it was keeping me alive um did you did you have that experience with your dad did you feel like he was coming to you or through you oh yeah all the time I feel like he's coming through me uh you know whether it's a song on the radio um you know the last guest that I had before you was his lead guitarist uh for Chooch and the Enchanters so I think subconsciously or consciously, I'm trying to find people that remind me of dad and and keep his spirit alive and carry the same happiness that he did and and what they do, you know? So that's, that's what I'm hoping to do through the, through the podcast and why I'm interested in talking with you about your research. Cause it, it it certainly seemed like something you were passionate about and, and took seriously. So. Yeah, I I just want to acknowledge your, your we always t- your dad was such a huge presence had a big smile, yeah always you felt better when he walked into the room 
And I have to acknowledge your mother, Marie, because yeah. uh, when there's a man that that is that happy and feels good about himself in his life, there is a, uh, a, a an amazing, extraordinary partner walking along beside him. And I know your dad gets lots of attention and your mom is incredible. So I, um, yeah. I, I love that you were born to these, you know, big, two big presents and also like I was 25 when my dad suddenly died and it's just like, like, yeah. come on. <laughs> so I, I just want to acknowledge your mom. She's an incredible person. <laughs> well, and uh, like you, she's a published author, wrote a book about me. Uh, my perfect son has cerebral palsy. And um, obviously your book, the autobiography of an orgasm, which we're going to get into. Uh, but just as far as chronicling a book, was that always a goal for you? I know it was for mom when, my diagnosis happened. <laughs> well, um, absolutely not to write about the secrets, secrets around my uh, secrets and shame around <laughs> my body and sensual path. I, I was right. writing a complete, I was always a writer. And so yeah, in my forties, as I was doing a lot of healing, I, um, and this is post-divorce, uh, and I, um, you know, started having these memories of, of, somebody had asked me like, when was the last time you felt really good in your body? And I mean, it's just like a, a regular question thinking, you know, I was maybe 44 at the time thinking maybe they'd say like, like last week, or I'd say, you know, Oh, last month when I was dancing and I had to keep going back and keep going back. And it just brought up these, these memories of, of things that I had buried that absolutely impacted my, my life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as a, a woman, as a mother, as a, somebody that didn't feel good in their body. And I just never recognized it. So I was writing a book about what I thought was super interesting about my life between the US, uh, Indiana and going to Zimbabwe. So it was this, you know, woman going back and forth and um, experiencing like this spiritual life with the with the land and the animals and the people there. And, um, mm -hmm. but I go into writing circles and, you know, to workshop the material and I'd read a chapter from the book about my life between the U S and Indiana and Zimbabwe. And I'd have like one line in there about, you know, a, a sensual encounter. And everybody was like, Oh, we want to know more about that. And I was like, I could never tell the truth about my sensual path. And it was at that moment, I felt this like zing in my body. Um, so it's those things that we don't want to write about that we don't want to look at that are actually what we need to look at. And so that one line uh, turned into my whole book. And it was really, it was, you know, the first line of my book is I had my first orgasm when I was 36, which means I spent half my life faking it. Mm. And it gets a good laugh. I mean, everybody, you know, it's so uncomfortable for people to talk about sex and orgasms and, but um, that gets a good laugh. But the reason that happened was because I had experienced so much abuse and trauma against my body mm. that it wasn't possible for me to feel anything. So I didn't even think it was, you know, possible. So then suddenly when I started doing this research, I put having an orgasm on my bucket list, you know, I was in my forties and, right. and, um, and once again, I never, I'd never told anybody about any of this because I'd never shared, you know, anything. So, right. um, no, I didn't expect to write a book about, you know, called Autobiography of an Orgasm. And, and the hard thing was my, you know, family, my mother, my closest friends, stories I'd never shared with anybody. I, you know, was releasing this book and it was very hard for them to handle the truth. I was going to ask you, I mean, what was the reception from... <laughs> family and friends, because something like that might cause a rift in relationships. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know for my mom, it was the hardest because she, she, first of all, we don't talk about those things. And, mm -hmm. uh, and she actually didn't read the book for two years and then her book club chose it and she <laughs> had to read it. And the interesting thing was when the book club chose it, they, um, and these women were in their seventies and eighties and um, the book doesn't go into what happened to me. It doesn't go into the trauma. It goes into my like quest to feel good in my body again. But at the very beginning is a scene of, of one thing that happened to me and um, as a child and me staying quiet. And every woman in that book club went around the circle and said, well, something happened to me too. And I stayed quiet. Something happened to me when I was in college. Something happened to me at work. Something happened to me. These are women in their seventies and eighties, not 
40s when I the book came out, mm -hmm. 70s, 80s, that kept this a secret all their life. So right. that was when my mother finally, you know, my mom and I, um, finally at the age of 50 and she was 80, we had our sex talk for the first time. <laughs> and it had so much healing for, you know, for us. My kids, I did, you know, talk to them about it and they, um, as uncomfortable as it was, I, they completely honored and respected it, especially my boys who, you know, were in their um, late teens, twenties, early twenties, and had already been with, um, uh, had already experienced being with females in their life who had experienced trauma, but mm. trauma can show up in other ways. So it gave them, uh, I think a more compassionate, um, view of, uh, I think in your early twenties, you just want to get laid a lot, a lot of guys. And instead of going like, oh, there mm. might be something more if a girl is wanting to give herself away that much. Um, there might be, there yeah. just might be a history of damage down the road or people pleasing. I mean, um, one of the responses to trauma is people pleasing. One of the responses to trauma is fight, flight, freeze, fawn. So, um, and then friends, I, I did, you know, um, I didn't want to make anybody look bad in the, the book. So I did, um, if I made anybody look bad, it was me. Um, but I did consult with, uh, a couple of former partners, uh, boyfriends, uh, lovers saying, I wrote this book. Um, here's the good news. I've never shared with you before. I've never been able to have an orgasm, uh, but I'm healed now. And I wrote a book and everything's great. And so all they could hear uh, is that I never had an orgasm with them. Like they couldn't hear past, like there was a lot of trauma. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And the, the, all they could hear. So one actually threatened to sue me. Another said, um, absolutely. Okay. This is part of our love story and I'm glad you're better, but it's a hard thing to, I mean, looking back, I mean, the book came out eight years ago. I give myself so much credit because for someone who was an introvert, very shy, mm. uh, had a lot of trauma. I really give myself, I can't believe I was that brave to really release the book. And it was the book that I needed when I was, you know, 13 and 16 and 18 and 20 and 30 and 35 and 40. And I have, I have people writing to me at those ages and also in their 80s saying, thank you for writing this book. Yeah. Um, you know, I was surprised. You can correct me if I'm wrong, if I get the statistic wrong, but one in three women mm -hmm. experience some form of uh, sexual abuse. I mean, that even going through the Me Too movement during college, I was surprised to hear that. And like you said, as, as a 28 year old, it's so valuable to have uh, your perspective on it. So then I can understand it and be a better partner in the future. So thanks yeah. for it. And I have to say that I, I mean, the uh, they say the odds are like one in five to one in six men. I think it's a lot closer to yeah. one in three, one in four, because once I started talking uh, about this, it wasn't just women writing to me and opening up to me. It was men too. Mm. And so, um, and even my son, Charlie, that died, that was something he really struggled with was that he had been uh, molested when he was in his teens. Mm. And, you know, it took me 40 years to speak up about this. It's, it's really hard for men. And so you know what, we have to like show, start showing up for these really uncomfortable conversations because otherwise these patterns are going to keep continue, continuing yeah. and the secrets just, they, they bury our shame and that shame lives in our bodies. And, um, yeah. and, you know, one thing I was, you know, really proud of is I had had so much trauma that was buried that I, I couldn't feel anything. Like I, I couldn't feel joy. I couldn't feel, I was just living in a body and going through life and you know that what looked good but didn't feel good and you know trauma does change your body and the great thing is then i did the work to change it back and um so now i live in a in a very uh you know i know what my triggers are now but i live in a body that can feel everything finally because when you experience trauma you're not just um your body doesn't just shut down uh the pain it also shuts down pleasure mm. so you're not having memories like I don't I, I was talking to my sisters recently and I don't have memories from high school I don't have I don't remember a lot of people's names because my body shut down everything it, and um so now I'm you know opening up and remembering again 
Well, and this didn't happen to me, but there was a there was an occurrence that happened when I was at Carmel. Um, they framed it as a hazing incident back in 2009, but uh, one of the managers for the basketball team was sexually assaulted by a few members of the the boys' team. And me as a sports broadcaster, subconsciously, I didn't want to go in the locker room, you know, like I, in order to prevent something like that from happening to me, it, you know, it, how much does that happen where it, maybe it doesn't even happen directly to someone, but trauma from somebody else causes issues and uh, decisions yeah. to change. <laughs> no, absolutely. And here's so, I mean, so you don't feel safe in right. the world and, um, um, and a lot of these conversations, I mean, I, this is need to be, you know, happen in our schools. We need to be trauma informed. I had, after my son died, I had someone very close to me come to me and say, oh, well, he was never going to get better. And I, that was, uh, this was somebody that was coming from a, a, a lack of trauma informed place. So we need to have, you know, be informed about trauma in our classrooms, in our families. We need to be able to have these conversations. Um, and one thing as a, you know, mother, now my kids are in their late twenties and early thirties, but I have grandchildren that are five years old girls. I don't want to pass this on. I mean, right. we're, we've got to stop this. We've got to stop this. I want you to feel safe to go into the locker room in your high school. We have to start having these tough conversations. You know, or, 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 you know, I'm talking, you know, I know you're not in high school now, you're way past it, but you shouldn't have to, I mean, that you're voicing that now is amazing, but you probably just avoided it without saying it to other people. Like, yeah. I'm not gonna go the room. Well, it was hard to travel. I mean, it, it's always just kind of um, in the back of your mind. And, you know, I, I grew up with Chucha and Marie who were kind of, hippies in comparison to the rest of Carmel. I mean, the thing that kills me about growing up in this community, it was a, a rich kind of well-off community, but at the same time, they're, they're sort of about hiding any sort of shame because that keeps the status quo and maintains the perfect image of the perfect community, right? Yeah. I, I mean, even right now, I'm a, a truth teller and I also live with a lot of secrets. Um, yeah both within my family and within my community. I, I live with um, uh, these secrets that, uh, and if people share something with me, it's from a place of, uh, of confidence uh, and knowing that I won't pass it on, but I'm also like urging people to, like share it with one person. But if we want to break these patterns, we need to share it with uh the community with our families uh, right. because that doesn't make that silence and those secrets doesn't make the community better right um it makes it not a safe place for um especially for our young children and i i have had the experience of, of having a woman in her 80s come to me huh. and tell me that she had been sexually assaulted last year but didn't speak up because she was afraid of what her friends were thinking. I'm like, this has to stop. This has to stop. Yeah. Well, and see, I grew up with uh, a disability. So that was always kind of in the back of my mind because there wasn't really, you know, I was surprised when I looked at it, the uh, ADA was passed in 92. <laughs> so they just humanized people with disabilities in the 90s. So the concept of people with disabilities dating other people and being a viable option for others was not something that my friend saw growing up, <laughs> uh, which was kind of weird. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So basically, you know, just before you were born, uh, you yeah. were, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so interesting. I, so I'm curious, did you, uh, you know, one of the chapters of the book um, that I really love, and it was a key moment for me was I was dating a man who was a yeah. quadriplegic and he had been a very successful, you know, Italian um, athlete and big future ahead of him and then was in an accident and had no feeling from the neck down. And I was in a relationship with him. And um, and it was one of the most sensual relationships of my life. Um, mm -hmm. But it also made me realize at the time I was still, you know, faking it and um, realizing, you know, here his body 
really had been shut down mm. and mine had been shut down in a different way. So if he was willing to research and explore um, feeling in his body again, then uh, I should, you know, be too. So something that that chapter, I, I love that chapter as well. Uh, something that that section reminded me of is that we need to be aware of all the sensors everywhere. Um, I think that we only think of designated areas, the pleasure or that it gets a reaction uh, in certain areas. You had to interact with his face in order for him to feel. I mean, that that was so profound for me to read about. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, and for all of us, we have these pleasure centers all over our body. Um, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, using toys in with in sensual encounters, but I would really challenge anybody, uh, not challenge, but invite you to just, uh, our hands, our, our fingertips have, uh, as almost as many, like a high concentration of nerve endings as we do in our genitals. They're like the two highest places in our body. So if you're using toys, then you are actually, um, not connecting with um, potential pleasure. So I I just think that, uh, especially in my research, at first I was going to, you know, ex sex experts and um, going to all these crazy, you know, classes and programs. And what it was doing was I was having someone, again, someone else tell me what was, um, be the authority on my body and tell me what felt good to me. We're, we're all in different bodies. Mm -hmm. We're all in different bodies. So it wasn't until I finally stopped taking all the classes and everything and did, uh, and all the books and just spent time getting to know my body every day. And, um, so like, know your, know yourself first. And I think it's an interesting thing now because, uh, um, when, this was, uh, a few years ago when I was, had started dating, um, someone and he's, he, he was actually intimidated by me because it's it like, um, when I feel good in my body, it's like he, I already, I, I wasn't looking for anybody to give me pleasure, explain my, expand my pleasure. Like uh, I knew myself and I could, uh, make myself, you know, feel good. And, um, and I think it was slightly intimidating because I think as women, we're always looking for the guy to give us something or looking for your partner to give us something right. instead of both like, um, uh, connecting and, and talking about, well, what feels good to you? And like right. the conversations we should be having with a partner, we should be having them first. We should be letting people into our hearts before we let people into our bodies. <laughs> well, and another important, uh, section in the book that I thought was really uh, important was you were talking, you were in, in a session with someone and you were talking about, uh, the insecurity of talking about your hearing loss, uh, with, yeah. with partners, uh, and I, I've thought about this, you know, with, with pain and, and certain things, but you were able to make the ailment sexy. Like how, how important is that to be able to frame what might be a weakness in quotes uh, and make it attractive to someone? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think we all have our, our weak spots or our insecurities. So it's, um, it's either we're going to try to hide, you know, these things, um, uh, I remember I had a, or we're going to work with them. And I just had to break that spell. Like I, I had this spell, like I finally figured out like how to have an orgasm. And then all of a sudden, you know, I was 50 and, and, uh, and in this category of, of women that aren't attractive or over the hill or all these terms that we give, you know, women um, of a certain age, um, and, uh, and then the, the hearing loss came. I'm like, oh my God, I can't because now I lip read. And so now I, um, I'm like, now I can't have the lights off. Like what's, what's that going to do? So it's just right. like, how can we have fun with this? Because when I relate, you know, some of my, uh, vulnerabilities, then the guys always, or the partners always have, uh, vulnerabilities too. So it's, can we, uh, I think we've been sold this, you know, version of, of sex and sensuality. I mean, I mean, my God, especially with, I, with porn and online, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I really feel for your generation who grew up with so many of you grew up with um, the opportunity to access it and um, and what it's supposed to look like and what you think turning on a partner is when um, when really it's so much different. I, I uh, 
I think if you can have, um, like you were saying, there are all these pleasure points on our bodies, but also just the, uh, I can stare into somebody's eyes for five minutes mm -hmm. and have more intimacy than I've probably had in my marriage. <laughs> well, and, and as a 28 year old, the thing that concerns me growing up with my, my fellow friends is like the attention span of my generation is so much shorter with, with Instagram, Snapchat, social media, uh, and, and also, you know, I, I've revealed uh, or tried to frame my disability as positive. Like, you know, we get the best parking <laughs> anywhere we go. Yeah. Uh, you know, you do have to try and make it funny. But at the same time, are are people willing to listen or absorb that information? That That's what's more concerning to me. <laughs> I, uh, um, I agree. I, um, I, <laughs> there was a man I, I dated. Uh, once and he was 10 years younger than me so he um he responded to anything I wrote like I'm a writer so even my texts I like you know I, little masterpieces and he would respond with like a winky face or a smiley face or you know just he he didn't write he could only respond with like just you know emojis and so our dates were exactly the same like this mm. guy could not hold a conversation and, um, but I'm willing to like, keep, you know, trying, but then there just becomes a point of like, yeah, this, this is not, this is not happening. So you're right. I mean, how, how do you, um, experience that? I mean, uh, dating apps is probably the best way to, to date now, but see, even then you're dealing with a couple of seconds and then swipe right, swipe left. I mean, it's, it's become so we're all objects that get placed in someone's perfect puzzle on Instagram. It seems like, yeah. um, so I don't know, you know, we're working toward solutions, well, I guess. Yeah. I like that you, you put your voice in the world with this podcast and, um, and I don't know if you're in a partnership right now, but my feeling is your partnership is going to come through your voice and, and, and these, you know, yeah. Uh, connections and conversations you're having because people do I, I i know we're living in this uh um snapchat quick you know emoji world but people really do want connection people really do want connection so i do believe that your person is coming through through your show i hope so i hope so uh sometime soon i did wear the uh print shirt for you today since that is your favorite uh artist and uh, coming from a singer and a published author, uh, I, I am the product of uh, dance music, uh, sex and romance. So do you think that there is a correlation between dancing, music and sex? I mean, I, I don't think I, you have to be able to think about it when you do that sort of thing. Uh, well, I will say if a man can dance um, and move his hips, and, I, and this includes my uh partner that was you know couldn't move from the neck down um if he can uh feel the music then i know yeah i know he's going to be a really uh beautiful partner um okay. and um it doesn't mean the the bad dancers aren't you know good in bed but there's there's there is something about really feeling somebody who has the the space to feel the music and um and let it you know change them in that moment it would be a derelict of my duty if i didn't ask this question um in your research and experience does size matter absolutely not absolutely not i um uh, um, and it, it wasn't a choice, but somebody that I was with was the, um, you know, absolutely um, was on the, you know, very small side. And he mm -hmm. was such, uh, once we, once we opened up about like, like what I needed, um, because I think he, his smallness what he did was make up and like doing tricks and it was almost like this acrobatic session he was trying to impress me so much and once I just said like could we just slow down actually when you slow down I feel more and mm -hmm. um and then it slowed him down and he was able to say so size absolutely doesn't matter and um and I've had some of my most you know sensual moments with um men of all different sizes so, so you're just to confirm 
it's more about possibly the connection and empathy between two people. Uh, absolutely. And just wherever you are, like go slow with, um, uh, if you're with your partner, they're going to feel, it's just like if you're giving a massage, um, if you're rubbing hard, I mean, you can feel, mm -hmm. you, know, it, you, you feel it, but not much. If you're going really, really slow with the touch, you feel so much more. So just go slow. And this is where porn has done, you know, horrible right. things for relationships because it's always like fast and hard. And, and, um, and there's also space for, um, going slow, feeling more and, and, and humor and connection. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wrote about some very, you know, humorous moments in, in the book. And I think that's one thing, even though it's a book about, um, you know, healing, uh, my body after, um, sexual assault, I don't promote the book as that. Uh, and you know, when the book first came out and one of the early reviews was, you know, like, this is a, a really funny, you know, book. And I was like, what? It's a funny book about my sensual path, but it was the point was like, actually how we are in in bed it, it like it is there are some funny moments there are some odd moments there are some quirky moments so can we just write about those too and um and don't um like just be authentic in the moment um one documentary that i saw recently came out in november of 2022 uh it was it was about one taste uh and i don't know if you uh did any of that research did you were you involved in any of those programs? Well, I, I did. I mean, I actually did write about doing the um, orgasmic meditation training and yeah. in the book. And that was who I did the, um, um, I took like two of their courses. I, um, I did not feel comfortable with the, um, cause actually the founder did uh, lead one and I was very uncomfortable with her, uh, with her view on treating women who had been violated, assaulted of, you know, just saying like, basically it's your fault. You, you, um, uh, so I, um, I wrote about it and I also got out of it. And I think a lot of those programs did a lot of damage. I'm actually want to update my book in the next year or so to um, address some of those things. And this is why with, with, the programs that I did, people write me now when they read the book and say, well, what are the three things? What are the three programs I should do? I'm like, no program, no program, no program. The three things you should do are spend 15 minutes a day, just tuning into your body, see mm. what feels good. Give yourself a self massage, listen to your body every day. Um, uh, another thing you should do is like, what feels good? What makes you feel good? Dance. Um, mm. um, but with those programs, all of a sudden, what you're doing is uh, buying into somebody else telling you that they're the expert on your body. And if you want to go deeper, then you need to buy the next program. <laughs> and so it's yeah. taking already wounded, traumatized people and adding more trauma to it. Um, so the only, um, I think, benefit of that documentary was just to show like there are so many of us who have had trauma in our lives and um but this isn't the way um some of the programs were very um helped me get from like point a to point b but i always think there's a better way and so that's what i've um tried to do with my work and i do work with people uh i mean my focus is on writing supporting writers but i do um work with people who want like sensual coaching but it, it just turns back i just put it back you know to them. It's not me giving them anything. It's helping them remember. Well, and this is something that I have to consciously remind myself of when it comes to mental health. And there was a portion in the book that I read about where you talked to a plant that was that needed help, that needed to grow. And as you positively talked to it, gave it reinforcement, it did start to grow. We as senti sentient beings, how important is it to talk to ourselves in a, in a positive way so positive I, I mean that was um it was that was at a like a really low point of my life and uh um and it was the first christmas without my kids post-divorce we did christmas together for 13 years and then suddenly there was there was a change in who my 
uh, former husband was dating and they didn't want me on my family trips. And I, so I was alone and I, um, and I remember this plant, which was looked dead. Um, I, you know, started to throw it away. And then I was like, I was going to keep the pot because the pot looked good. The plant wasn't good, but I was going to keep the pot. It was in, and when I started to throw it away, the, the bottom, uh, the roots were still green. And so I like carefully, you know, uh, put it back in the pot, watered it. And then for some reason told it, I love, you know, I was like, I love you. And, uh, and I think, you know, in the end, that's what I was like, it was keeping me alive, but I was basically saying, I love you to me too, at a very low, low moment in, in my life. And I mean, I couldn't believe it. I kept doing that. And within, you know, a couple months it started to sprout. And then I had, you know, orchids uh, a few months later. So it is, I mean, we all go through hard times and we live in this world too of, um, I'm all for uh, people doing selfies and uh, especially women. We've lived in this world that um, that uh, women or um, anybody with disabilities, we live in a world that we, we um, are only seen in a certain way. So I, I am all for people um, showing themselves, you know, however, however they want on social networking. And we also need to um, treat ourselves really, really well and tell ourselves the things that we need to hear. Um, this is something that makes me so sad at the end of Charlie's life. Um, you know, he died alone in a hotel room. There happened to be fentanyl in drugs that he bought. Uh, but he didn't die alone. He died with all of the negative words he was saying to himself but they were also things that other people had said to him yeah uh so we you know during those low time low times more than ever we need to be the ones we've got to stop waiting for other people to validate ourselves we've got to stop waiting for other people to give us our orgasms we've got to stop waiting for other people to make us feel good about our life we need to be the one validating ourselves it's, it, 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 it truly is life-saving. That's so true. And it's tough too, because, you know, you had the Trump era, <laughs> the Trump presidency, uh, you know, the insurrection, everything. Involved, I mean, there were so many individual components with that. And, uh, you know, I thought about reading your book, uh, The Midterm Elections, and how much was at stake with women's rights and racial tensions. I mean, all of that was kind of intertwined in what you were talking about. So it's a, you know, a great time to have a podcast, but at the same time, it's like, what future will be there? Uh, you know, we're building toward a better one, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is why it's, it, it's the best source you have right now is your voice. Yeah. And, uh, and whether it's a hundred people listening or a hundred thousand people or 10 million, the most important person listening to you right now is yourself. You know, I, I read about two, uh, your adventure um, overseas. Uh, they say you can't get better in the place that got you sick. Uh, how important is it to travel and to get outside uh, what you're used to when it comes to healing? I, um, uh, well, I, I mean, for me, I never traveled when I was younger. We I grew up uh, in a, a family that went to Disney World every spring mm -hmm. break and Canada fishing every um, summer. And and I loved it. Uh, and it wasn't until my 30s, late 30s, early 40s that I really started to travel. Never dreamed of going to anywhere in Africa. And that's become a very important part of my life. I, um, I you know, my son, Charlie, when he was eight, he at his school, his teacher at school and the therapist at school, um, you know, advised us that he needs to be put on, uh, uh, you know, eight Adderall or Ritalin mm. and won't sit still. They never asked, like, um, how's he doing with the, you know, divorce? How's he doing with, you know, going between two homes? They, they just wanted to label him. So I took him out of school and took him to India with me. And that was a life-changing trip for both of us, um, especially because uh, I got to see India through my eight-year-old son's eyes, who mm. didn't see the worst of India, which I was just seeing, like you know, poverty and and kids on the street. My son, 
showed me to see the best of India. And so I do think it's so important to travel. And that was one thing, um, I mean, in this past year, Charlie was just like going between being great and then trauma also, you know, uh, impacts your mental health. And then he'd, he'd have these, you know, really horrible um, moments that, uh, you know, he didn't feel safe and he didn't make others feel safe. And, but we had talked about going back to India uh you know, back to where he was when he was eight, because we stayed at this um, near the board of Tibet in a, 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 a monastery, and he hung out with the young monks. So we talked about going back. Um, anyway, uh, I am going to take his ashes back there, um, some of his ashes back in February and release them in the Ganges River, okay. which I know he would love. Um, so it's these things that don't... Um, I mean, I feel it's like this type of travel or these type of moments that make a life. Do I need to do this? Does Charlie need it? Um, is it in some book that it's going to, you know, make everything better? No, but it's just um, following, you know, for me, it's, it's something that matters. So, uh, you know, not all of us can, can just take off and go travel the world, but you know, also take time to travel your inner world too. So yes, traveling is important. And also not every, I mean, my two other boys, Sam and Willie, they just want to stay close to home. They like to do the same things. They'd be, they would have been perfect in my childhood, go to the same place every year. Um, so travel is not important to everybody. So, um, but you might get to it later in life too. So but like I did. Um, as far as back to uh, the research that you did, are, would you recommend like any precautions that, that folks take i mean it's sort of a daunting thing to to explore this thing and i just didn't know if you had any precautions that you would recommend to people well like i said i mean if i could give my self-advice to the younger me i would um actually sh have the conversations first that we need to have um you know allow people into my heart before i allow them into my body um i would be very cautious um uh, about using any, um, I mean, I was never a drug user. I did drink. Um, uh, yeah. So there were times I probably ended up with people uh, that I might've made a different choice if I hadn't had, you know, uh, a third glass of wine. Um, but, uh, you know, so these, there's these things that we do to date to get to know people like going out and having a couple drinks. And it can also, um, it can, you know, soften the conversation, but it can also influence you <laughs> a bit. And, and yeah. um, I just found it's, it's your, your body is more alive when you're completely sober and in, you know, in the moment. And um, um, so precautions, uh, I mean, there wouldn't, I, my only suggestions would be like, before you go to bed with someone, see if you can stare in their eyes for five minutes. Right. And, uh, and then, you know, and then make your choice based on that. Because if they can't be present uh, for, for that five minutes, then maybe they're not going to be present for you in bed. Well, and see, that's, that's one other thing I uh, wanted to mention when it comes to dating. I think that when uh, people message uh, folks now, uh, we build up this image in our head of this perfect person and then when we meet them in real life it doesn't meet our expectation and we're disappointed um we have to look at them and, and be like you said be present with them uh, and see what that is <laughs> before making any decisions yeah and we're all trying to like put on our best and 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 we all have a little bit of pain and we all have a little bit of disappointment and so right just know whoever you're meeting probably has experienced some heartache. I, I was just, um, I made the choice not to date the past, um, almost 10 years. And, um, but I'm, I'm like, I'm getting ready. I'm, I'm, you know, ready to, uh, um, I actually wanted to be present for Charlie. I wanted to be present for my grandkids. I mm. wanted to be present for myself, not always looking for someone, but I, I was just telling someone I'm ready, but I'm like, I need him to be like, a little depressed, like someone that writes like <laughs> sad, like sad country songs, um, mainly because it not depressed it, but I need him to understand sadness. Sure. Because that is part of my life. And so 
it doesn't mean I'm a sad, depressed person, but I need him to understand sadness. I need him to understand loss. I need him to. Um, so, you know, what are the things that you need your partner to also understand? Um, um, it's not just uh, finding, you know, the person that lights up your whole world. And and it's a different time than when your parents met. I mean, sure. they got <laughs> so yeah. I, um, but yeah, that's one of my requirements now. I'm like, I need them to be, to write you, like so, sad country songs. Do you know how uh, Chooch got Marie? Have you heard that story? No, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> so uh, dad played, he was the band uh, at Ike and Jonesy's for like 15 years, uh, Ricky and the Rowdies. And yeah. he was playing uh, Hard to Handle trying to think oh the black crows version and there's a line in there uh take my hand i'll prove every word i say and as he delivered that line mom was standing there you know watching him so at that point you know uh chooch chooch had marie and i i'm the product you're, you're looking at it right now so there you uh, go <laughs> uh, that's brilliant i i do want to ask you um how to because i i deal with this a lot of writers and writing about family and and when your mom uh, decided to write her book, um, did she, did you read it first? Did she get permission? Because um, hmm. it's one thing to write about someone that's passed, like Charlie. I, on purpose, didn't write what he was going through prior to his death. Now I am needing to. But yeah. did you, how was that for you to um, have your mom write that book? And did, you, did she ask for permission? Uh, she did not. I, <laughs> I was diagnosed at 18 months and then it came out when I was five. I first read it when I was in high school. Um, mm -hmm. and it was meant to be, I mean, my, my doctor, Dr. Chuck Dietzen, who has traveled the world has called the book a, a love story. Uh, mm -hmm. cause it just kind of chronicles, you know, the hope that we had in spite of bad news of me being diagnosed. Um, I, I personally don't want anything else published unless I do it, uh, though, at this point. So, but, you know, uh, mom and dad also gave me the talent to, to write and pro podcasts like this and, and chronicling stories like yours, Betsy, uh, you know, it helps me get through the days. It's, it's not easy, but uh, we're, we're getting through it day by day. So. Well, I admire the work you're doing in the world. And like I said, you're, it's the one thing with this really challenging dynamics in the world now is the one thing we can all do is use our voice and you're yeah. doing that and also show up for hard conversations with each other and then be able to get back to love, yeah. show up for hard conversations. And even you inviting me to be on to talk about this book. So many people, I mean, I wrote right on my <laughs> this, this book about writing just so my mom didn't have a, when someone asked her what books does your daughter write just so she didn't always have to say autobiography of an orgasm you know right. so yeah. Um, yeah so but just like but i i don't think this should be taboo anymore um because it's just not worth it because so many have suffered and as we saw with me too and my book came out three years before me too you know there's a lot of anger there's a lot of people wanting justice wanting to get even and the the issue is every single person that was abused was abused by someone that had also been abused. Mm -hmm. So it's just this, this pattern and it doesn't make it right or anything, but there, there, we, we can't just, you know, putting someone in jail isn't going to solve um, the silence around the abusers, what they've gone through. So we need to heal ourselves first. You're never going to get your abuser to apologize to you. We need to heal ourselves, be in charge of our body. You can change your body back. Um, and then, you know, use our voice, you know, express ourselves. We're here to experience the world and then express ourselves. And Prince was so good at that. <laughs> I was going to ask you too, did you ever have a chance to see him live? I didn't have the chance. No. I, this is incredible. I, there are very few people who I'd go to see, um, but Prince in 2017, I was in Australia and I'd been there working for a month and I had to fly out of Sydney. So I, um, and Prince was going to be there for three nights at a concert in a small venue, only 1700 people. I'd never yeah. seen him in my life. So I was like, Prince is one person I want to see. So I went online on the day that the tickets came out and um, sitting in this cafe in Byron Bay, Australia. And so put in for one ticket and, um, and it pops up, I get it. And it's, it's in the front five rows in the center. And so I put all my information in and then I press send 
and a screen pops up and says, uh, you're, that's an American credit card. You fill this out one, wrong, try again. You know, so this is like five minutes later, try again, they're sold out. Oh no. And so I was like, Prince, if you want me there, then give me that ticket again. And so I, I tried, 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 got a ticket at the back. I was like, no Prince, I want to be back in front. Tried again, got center row, I'll see 10 rows back and went to see Prince on my last night in Australia. Awesome. And he died two months later. I was going to say in 17, he it had to have been close. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was interesting. A, Go ahead. Do you have a favorite song? <laughs> well, it's, it, I mean, I was, you know, hoping for um, like, you know, all of his popular songs, especially for this, um, when he, for his encore and the song that the last song he played and he played it over and over and over again, this mantra, free yourself, free yourself. It's not one of his, it's hard, you'd have to look it up, free yourself. And just over and over again, he was doing this mantra and he was he, free yourself until all of us were like singing it, singing it and you know, chanting it, chanting it, 10 minutes, free yourself, free yourself. And this was at a time like where I was really, um, you know, like locked in my life and it's free yourself, free yourself, free yourself. And I got it. Like, this was the song that I needed to hear. Um, the other thing that happened that night was uh, as I was walking out, um, I was pulled aside and given this purple box and, uh, and it had a beautiful t-shirt and it had two wristbands and they said, you know, uh, you're invited to Prince's after party. Um, wow. I think they were just yeah. invited like, you know, <laughs> girls and it's at <laughs> place you know it's going to start at 3 a.m i was like this is the best night of my life so go back to my um my flight the next morning go back to my hotel room because it was only you know like midnight then and i was like okay i'll just rest and then uh -huh. go to the club and uh get back to my hotel room and i was like i don't remember the name of the club oh and they hadn't written wow. it down so i had this two yeah so that was the beginning and end of my night with prince <laughs> well i i do hope to uh make it to paisley park man it, it would be really cool that's yeah. sort of uh my graceland you know that he was sort of a otherworldly figure that people still want to see so have you had yeah. a chance to go there i haven't yet and i really do want to go there um yeah and i will say seeing your dad on stage i'm not just saying that but <laughs> but there are people with just like stage presence that make everybody feel really good um, and your dad was one of those people, you know, he, he, he had that Prince, like, really. So it's just like, uh, Thanks. there's, so there's something with Prince. If you're, if you're ever trying to, um, like, even before you go on a date, like just channel that energy, <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, Prince would show up for the, I mean, he would show up for the hard conversations and Prince got it. And Prince would speak out and use his voice. And, um, yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> just just go for it he uh, prince uh, his performance of uh purple rain at super bowl 41 uh it it always makes me cry because the colts won and i remember watching it with dad i mean it's it's like it's like dad's gift to me now looking back you know such a beautiful performance uh, incredible moment i'm sure you've seen the, yeah. the behind the scenes documentary of that oh yeah uh, I, I worked with uh noel castler who was like a behind the scenes guy and worked with the um the marching band who had the the lights on and he yeah. he said that um by the end of the performance all of the lights ha had gone out because of the rain but it didn't yeah. matter at that point it was such a electric time yeah. um betsy i i know you do listen to music too uh, as a way to heal uh and music is proven to change uh, molecular structure so what are some uh songs that you use to to feel better I, um, well, my kids always know at my, um, uh, you know, when I die, I want Blackbird played, which, you know, I never imagined when, you know, it ended up being Charlie's because all my kids learned that as their first song on guitar and, and it was played at Charlie's celebration of life. Um, I love the Stevie wonder song as, yeah. um, turn the truth into love and, um, yeah, I, I guess those would be, you know, my first two that I'd mention. Um, what are some uh, upcoming projects that you have for yourself? Well, thanks for asking. I, um, uh, with 
this um, writing that's happened since Charlie died, I had someone say to me, it was on a day that I'd gotten lost uh, driving because I was like, you do normal things after someone dies and you're in this fog. So every time I drove, I would, you know, get lost. Um, the day after Charlie died, I uh, had to drive somewhere and somebody almost hit me. And I kept yeah. thinking it was everybody else, you know, that were bad drivers. And finally, I was like, yeah, I'm like the common person in this. But so so a friend said, you know, I've, I'm on the insurance uh, or she's on um, the board of insurance companies. She said, you're at higher statistics now to get in an accident. So, you know, don't drive under the influence of death. And that really stuck with me um, because at any minute we are living under the influence of something. It might be the death of a son. It might be the disappointment of um, your last partner. It might be um, uh, your last orgasm. I mean, it doesn't have to be bad. It can be good too, but we're all living under the influence of something. So I um, am uh, writing a book. It's called Writing Under the Influence. And it's it's how, you know, it's part memoir and part writing guide of how to get these stories out um, in a way that can help us heal and in a way that uh, can help us find meaning, especially in those moments that yeah. are hard or disappointing. And I'm also working on a specific book about Charlie and telling his whole story because there's a lot more to the story. It's easy, for, you know, with um, we're seeing a lot of people, young people die of overdoses. And in some cases, they can be true overdoses. Um, and in Charlie's case, it was so much more. I mean, he was somebody whose trauma broke him piece by piece. And um, it wasn't an overdose that took his life. And and we need to do better in our communities and families and um, and world in, in making space for trauma-informed conversations and not making the alcoholics and the drug addicts um, and people with mental health issues, the bad guys, because what they're really saying is I am hurt. I am in pain. And, um, and even if I'm screaming pain at you, it can't be pain screaming at pain somewhere along the line. I need connection. I need you to listen. And so I'll, I'll be writing that story, um, hopefully from a place that will mm. help others. Empathy now more than ever. Um, as far as folks uh, reaching out and following you, how can how can they do that? Um, I think I'm most active on Instagram, and it's Betsy B Murphy. And then my website is betsybmurphy.com. And if you write me through my website, I'm the only one that reads the um, the emails. I, uh, I admire people because I, I I get a lot of really personal. Uh, emails. And like I said, I'm the holder of secrets. Mm -hmm. I didn't intend to be this way, but I, um, people t share some really incredible stories with me. And I'm always telling people like share, if you've had trauma, share it with one person. And, uh, and I've been that person a lot. And I, um, but I'm always like, I can't believe they're sharing this with me. And then I'm like, oh yeah, well, I shared my most, you know, personal, um, challenges and, and traumas and, um, and be, let's all be curious about how we can, what's beyond them. Cause we don't have to get stuck in the trauma. Like my son did what's beyond it for him could have been a life with his two young girls. <laughs> and yeah. Well, um, it's an absolute joy to, uh, talk to you today and Betsy, please know that you're helping a lot of people heal with, with what you're talking about. So thank you. Appreciate thank it. You, Jimmy. All right, folks, to hear this again, you can check out my website, jbkonair.com. You can also get the podcast anywhere by searching my initials, J-B-K-O-N-A-I-R. Until next time, have a great day and a better tomorrow.